All right, so we're going to finish up this week by looking at 2.5. As I said, we're not going to be doing 2.6 or 3.1. Uh, we'll be skipping those, those two sections. So 2.6, 2.7, and then we go right to chapter 3, which is on polynomials. So we're not really going to get much into chapter 3 this week. But let's take a look at a formula we've used before, which is the projectile motion formula. And we've looked at this formula when we wanted to say solve for when an object was exactly a certain amount off the ground. Well, we're going to look at kind of the same thing, but we're going to solve for maybe when an object is at least a certain amount off the ground. So that would turn it into an inequality. So the formula again is negative 16t squared plus v sub 0t plus F s sub 0. V sub zero is the initial speed that the uh, object is, is launched at. Uh, T is your time. And S sub zero is an initial height of the object. And plugging all that in on the right, we'll calculate the height of your object in feet at a certain time. So. It says a ball is thrown straight up from ground level with an initial velocity of 80 feet per second. All right, let's write that all out uh, and just fill it into our formula and then we'll see what they want us to do after. S equals negative uh, 16 T squared. And what's my initial velocity? So, yep, yeah, Madison? 80 feet, per 80 feet per second. And what's my initial height? Zero. Zero, because it says ground level. All right. So there's my formula that represents the height of the object based on the conditions in this problem. Questions on that? Oh, so that's my height. They want to know when the ball is at least 64 feet above the ground. So what does that mean when you say at least 64 feet? If we have to translate that into an inequality. Yep, Nick? X is greater than 64. Uh, or equal to? Greater than or equal to, yes. At least means greater than or equal to. So we want our height to be greater than or equal to 64 feet. What is our height? This is our height. So we want height greater than or equal to 64. So what I'm going to do on the calculator is I'm going to graph height in y1. I'm going to graph 64 in y2. And then I'm going to try to see where the height graph is above or equal to the horizontal line at 64. All right, so we've got negative 16x squared plus 80x. And then we've got 64. So we're going to want to set um, our window. X represents time. Um, what should be the minimum amount of time that we focus on? Yep. Zero. Yeah, zero means like right at the beginning, right? Right before you launched it, what was the height? The maximum amount of time, we don't know. We'll do 10. If it's in the air more than 10 seconds, it's going to go off the screen. We'll fix it. And now my height. What's my minimum height in this problem? So that means it's starting 64 feet off the ground? Zero. Yeah, it's, the minimum height is zero. It, it does start at zero. We don't know what the maximum is. It's going to go up. The question here is, when is it above 64 feet? But it's not always above 64 feet. It will be under that at some point. 
Okay, so we do want to look at from zero up to, let's assume it doesn't go over 85 feet. If it does, the parabola will go off the screen. Okay. It's not critical that it went off the screen because they're not asking what the maximum is. They're just asking when it's above 64. And I can see that. If you really want to try to get the whole thing on the screen, probably 110 or so. Would do it. But again, what well, I wasn't super critical. So what do you think I'm going to have to calculate here to see when it's above 64 feet? Maybe? The intercept. Yeah, the intercept. So there's a time when it crosses 64 feet on the way up, and then it comes back down, and it hits 64 feet again. So the object is above 64 feet, starting at one second. So my time has to be greater than one second. And it has to be less than, I think it's four seconds. Did you do the other one? Yeah, four seconds. So when you launch this object, if you observe the height of it at any time between one second and four seconds, it will be above 64 feet off the ground. Any question on that? Yeah? My calculator, once you graph it, doesn't come back down. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. Uh, and you typed your equation in exactly like that, the negative 16x squared plus 80x? Uh, I didn't do negative. OK. All right, so now. Let's think about how long the ball is actually in the air for. What does that mean if the ball is in the air? Think about what does that mean about its height? Yeah? It's greater than the uh, or greater than zero. It's greater than zero. So now what we want to basically figure out is when is the height greater, I guess, I don't know if you could say equal to, I mean, technically when it's equal to zero, it's back on the ground. Um, it's kind of a picky point. But technically, we do want the height to be greater than zero. So let's look up our formula again for the height. Negative 16t squared plus 80t. And we want to figure out when this is greater than zero. All right. So, did anybody see something we could pull out of the first two terms on the left? You want to solve that, but we don't want to get into quadratic formula because you don't have a constant term. So whenever you don't have a constant, you don't need quadratic formula or anything like that. Nick? No. I was going to say you could divide by t, but... Well, we can't divide by it, but we can... There's another word for it. We can factor it out. So we can factor out a t. And what else could we factor out? Yeah? 16. 16. I'm even going to factor out a negative 16 just because I want the, the squared term. Um, that part to be positive. So let's factor out a negative 16t. What would be my first term in parentheses if I factor out a negative 16t? t. And then that would have to be a minus. And negative 16t times negative what gives me 80t? 5. Any question on factoring them? So now we just have to think about that a little bit. You've got two things. You've got one factor, and you've got the second factor. 
t is always going to be what kind of number? Always going to be positive, or it could be what else besides positive? Yeah? Zero. It could be zero. Um, but t is never going to be negative. That's important. t will never be negative. Okay? Think of t as always being a positive number. What does that mean about this? If t is always a positive number. Yeah? That has to be negative. This is always going to be negative. Always. Negative 16 times t will always be a negative number. Okay, we kind of did this idea when we did the absolute value um, fraction in the homework. Now, you have a negative times something, and you always want it to be greater than zero. What would have to go right there? It would have to be a negative. T minus 5, if you're trying to solve this algebraically and make that true, and you know the first factor is always going to be negative, then the second factor has to also be negative. So a negative times a negative would give you a number greater than 0. Any question why this has to be negative? Because if it was positive, you'd have a negative times a positive, and that wouldn't give you a result greater than 0. So now, all we have to focus on in this problem is how do you make that negative? When is t minus 5 a negative answer? Whenever that happens, that's the answer to this question. So let's see if we can figure that out. When is t minus 5 less than 0? When does it come out negative? Uh, well, what would be the answer to that? Yep. Uh, t has got to be anything less than 5. Right. So what that means is how long is the object in the air for? That was the original question. Less than 5 seconds. So it's in the air like 4.99999 seconds. What happens right at 5 seconds? It hits the ground. So technically at 5 seconds it hits the ground. But it's in the air for just under 5 seconds. Any question on that? Yeah? Would you have to write um, like 0 is less than or equal to t as well so that like it stops at 0 or can you just keep? Um, so yeah, in this case we, we made the assumption earlier on that t is already a positive number. That, that's how we came up with this fact. So since we've already said t is a positive number, um, we don't have to ever worry about like saying t is greater than zero. We already know it. It has to be greater than zero because it's time. Yeah, but that's a good, that's a good question. All right. So now let's. Um, I'm going to skip over that one. When is the ball at least 64 feet off the ground? We already did that graphically. I'm going to show you how you could do a problem like this algebraically. How could you figure out when it's 64 feet off the ground without you? And that involves what's called a sign pattern. And a sign pattern is basically looking at a number line and determining, OK, if I plug in numbers on this part of the number line, I get a negative result. If I plug in numbers on this part of the number line, my formula gives me a positive result. It's all about finding basically what I, what I just said. So every time we have a linear factor, right? this, is, this is a linear factor. When you factor it, you don't have any exponents in your factor higher than a 1. Every linear factor is 0 at exactly one number. This would be 0, if you think of it on a number line, at 3. If you plug in numbers bigger than 3 into this expression, you'll end up with a positive result. If you plug in numbers less than 3 into this expression, you're going to end up with a negative result. 
but three is the dividing point between whether your calculation results in a positive or a negative number. T minus one, that's another linear factor. At one, you get zero. If you plug numbers bigger than one into this formula, you get a positive result. If you plug in numbers less than one into this formula, just pick a number less than one and try it, you get a negative result. Same thing here. So the idea is, in order to be able to solve inequalities that are higher powers, like quadratic inequalities, they have to be factorable for the method I'm teaching you. So what we're going to end up doing is basically what I kind of showed you right here is you end up drawing a number line, you mark the number on the number line where the root is, and then you mark each section of it as positive or negative. And we have to do this for as many factors as we have. So for a quadratic, usually you have two. All right, so we're going to look at an example, and we're going to do it up to this step. There's one, one more step, so leave a little bit of room after draw our number line. And we'll fill in that last step when we get to it. I want to just try an example up to this point. All right, so again, leave a little bit of space, but let's, let's start this one. Again, if you can't factor this, then this whole method is not going to work. Okay, we've got to be able to factor it. Um, Maddie, could you tell me, uh, in my first term, in each set of parentheses, uh, what they would have to be? X. All right, an x, and what else? Two x. A 2x. All right, 2 is prime, so that's my only option. Um, how about my signs? Both positive, both negative, or one of each? Yep, it's going to be one of each. It does make a difference. So let's just try negative positive. See what happens. And now I need two numbers that multiply to give me five. And it does matter which one we put where. Nick? Negative five and positive one. Good. That's where they're going five and one. Um, let's try it the other way. So what would you put here? One and five. Yeah, let's try one and five, because when we multiply, two x times five gives me ten x. Negative one times x is negative x. Is ten x take away one x? What I want in the middle? Yeah. Then we factor it. Okay. So for any questions on the factor? Okay, so now the next step is we're trying to figure out where this times this is greater than zero. So there's different things that could happen. We could end up with a positive times a positive. That, that could work. So we have to figure out where is this positive and where is this positive, and is there an overlap that makes them both positive at the same time? Or we could figure out where this is negative and where this is negative, and is there an overlap in those numbers that make them both negative at the same time? What we can't have happen is one of them positive and one of them negative. That would not come out greater than zero. So I'm going to show you kind of an organized way to figure out where these are both positive or where they're both negative. Yep? Do we have to do both negatives and both positives when we do this? Or do yes. We... Yep, because that's it's two different sets of x's that will, will work. Yep. So first, in order to figure out where these are positive, we're going to do one at a time. Let's start with the 2x minus 1. What value makes 2x minus 1 exactly 0? Nick? One half. One half. Can anybody tell me, if you plug in numbers bigger than one half, 
into that expression, what kind of answers do you get? Positive or negative? Positive. What if you plug numbers that are smaller than a half in for the variable? What kind of answer do you get? Michael? Negative. So we've just determined the sections that make 2x minus 1 positive, numbers larger than a half, and the numbers that make it negative, smaller than a half. Now let's do the same thing for x minus 5, x plus 5, and then we're going to put the two number lines together, and that's going to tell us where they're both positive or where they're both negative, and that's what we need to know. So what value of x makes x plus 5 negative? Or actually, what value makes it exactly 0? Start with that. Yep. Negative 5. Again, these two number lines are totally separate. They're not to scale compared to each other. If you plug in numbers larger than negative 5 into this expression, what kind of answers do you get? Mabel? Positives. And Julie, if you plug in numbers smaller than negative 5 in for the variable, you would get? Negative. Negatives. Now, put it all together. We're going to make a number line for both of them, and we're going to put both roots on the number line. There's the negative 5, and here is the 1 half. So our goal is to figure out what's happening in each section of the number line when you do the product. Let's start in the left section. That's below negative 5 in both of them. If you are below negative 5 in the top one, what kind of answer would you get? Negative, right? You'd be like down here. That would be a negative. So a negative. What if you are below negative 5 in the bottom one? That's a negative. And what's a negative times a negative? That's a positive. Now let's look at numbers between negative 5 and 1 half. We're going to check out this middle section. Start with the top one. If you are between negative 5 and 1 half, what section would you be in on the top number line? You'd be in the negatives. You'd be like right in here. That's between negative 5 and 1 half. So that's a negative. What if you are between negative 5 and 1 half on the bottom number line? That's positive. That would be like in here, somewhere. It would stop at 1 half, but you're in the positive section. Negative in this one, positive in this one. What's a negative times a positive? A negative. Now, let's look at what happens if we pick a number that's bigger than 1 half for both of them. In the top section, where would you be if you pick a number larger than 1 half? You'd be in the positives. How about in the bottom, if you pick a number larger than 1 half? You'd be in the positives there as well. So that would be a positive times a positive, which is a positive. When you put the answers together like this, they always alternate in each section. Positive, negative, positive. Or negative, positive, negative. But they always alternate. So now we just have to go back up and look at the question. Was the answer where it's less than zero or where it's greater than zero? Greater than zero. So the sections where it's greater than zero are here and here. How would you describe all the numbers in this left section? Yeah? Negative 5, 2, 3. Or negative infinity to negative 5. Yes. Negative infinity to negative 5. That describes those. Or, how would you describe all the numbers in that other section? Yeah, Mabel? Um, 1 half to 5. Good. 1 half to positive infinity. So you can pick any number anywhere on that number line that's in the left section or the right section. What you can't do is pick numbers in the middle. They would not work. 
And that's, that's basically how you do a, a sign pattern. Just a way to mentally keep track of all the positives and negatives and where, where things are happening. Um, so we've got, we'll probably skip the division one. Division is the same as multiplication. There's no difference in how you do it because the rules for dividing positives and negatives are the same for multiplying. If you divide two negatives, it's positive. If you divide two positives, it's a positive. Same rules. Let's look at this one. Um, how many factors does this one have? Three. three. So we're going to have to find three roots, make three separate number lines, or if, if you think you can handle it, you could jump right to the final number line, but that might be a lot to think about mentally. Um, so let's do one at a time. What value of x makes the first factor zero? Zero. zero. If you plug in numbers bigger than zero, you get positives. Smaller than zero, you get negatives. What value of x makes my second factor zero? Michael? Negative three. Negative three. If you plug in numbers larger than negative three, we're just focusing on that. Don't look at anything else. You get positives. If you plug in numbers smaller, you get negatives. And how about the last one? What if you uh, what value of x would make x minus one zero? One. One. Good. One. I tried to draw them to scale a little bit, but again, these are just three separate number lines. Now we're going to put them all together, and we're going to have three divisions on my number line, which is going to separate it into how many sections. Four. Okay, we're going to have four sections on the number line. So we're going to have a section that represents negative infinity to negative three. Then we're going to have negative three to zero. Then we're going to have zero to one. And then one to infinity. Now we'll do the first two sections, but remember, once you find one, it's just going to alternate signs every time. Let's look at negative three on all number lines, right? and then we'll multiply the results together. Um, looking at the first number line, if I am negative three or less on the top one, what section am I in? Oh, Tim? Uh, this is the negative. Yep, it would be a negative. Let's look at below negative three on the middle number line. Uh, Madison, if I am Below negative 3 on the middle one, what section am I in? The negative. I'm in the negative again. And let's look at the x minus 1. Um, how about, Lindsay, if I am below negative 3 on the bottom number line, what section am I in? Negative. I'm in the negatives again. And what's a negative times a negative times a negative? Negative. Negative. So if you pick numbers less than negative 3 and plug them into this, the result would come out negative which isn't what we want. We want positives. So the next section should be positive from negative 3 to 0. But we'll check this one. And then if it comes out positive, we'll just write the other two alternating. Yep. Uh, is there any case in which it does not alternate? No, not with the kind of problems we're doing. All right. nope, that's a good question. But these kind of polynomials always alternate. All right. First number line, uh, Nick, between negative 3 and 0. What section am I in? Negative. Yep, I'm in the negatives. Second number line. Um, Sophie, between negative 3 and 0, what section? Um, yeah, we're in the positive section. Yeah, like right, in, right in there somewhere. So positive. And the bottom number line, between negative 3 and 0. Um, Annalise, what section am I in? Negative. Yeah, I'm in the negatives. I'd be like, right in here somewhere, between negative 3 and 0. Negative times positive times negative will give me a positive. That's negative. That's positive. So now you know where you're greater than 0 
there's two sections and where you're less than zero. So let's just go up and see what they want to know. Greater than or equal to zero. Here and here. How could we describe the numbers in that first section that I circled? Tim? Negative three to zero. And how would you write it? Um, Let's use interval notation. Interval notation? Uh, ooh, which, oh, uh, that would be neg the it's interval with the parentheses or no? It could use parentheses if you think it's open. Uh, negative, negative three to zero with parentheses. No, with brackets. Yeah. Why is it with a bracket? Because it can still be um, greater than zero if it is. No, wait. I also have no clue. Mike? You can still have negative three and zero uh, and still have a positive number. Well, in this case, they're not just interested in getting a positive number. They're also interested if you get... Oh, I, oh, oh, I didn't see the equal to. Oh. Equal to. It's okay if you equal zero. So it, does, it doesn't have to just be positive. It could be zero or positive. So it's okay if we include the negative three and the zero. That will give us either a result of zero or higher. Um, and how about that last section? How do you write that one? Yeah, two. One to infinity. One to infinity. What kind of symbol on the one? Bracket. Bracket. How about infinity? Parentheses. Oh, parentheses. Yeah. So that describes your two answers um, for that one. If they wanted to know where this one is less than or equal to zero, it would be the other two sections. That'd be the only difference. Any questions on that? Uh, yeah. It's not necessarily on that, but when you're graphing and there's a parenthesis yeah. or bracket, how do you know which way to, to like shape or have your arrow pointing? Because I know if like it's a parenthesis, it doesn't necessarily mean it's less than. It could be greater than. Uh, yeah. So the parenthesis always has to like if you're like if it was x is greater than two then the parenthesis would have to face right because it's greater than. And then if you turn that into interval notation, you just put it normal, like put the parenthesis normal, you don't flip it. No, you wouldn't flip it because x is greater than 2. You would just write from 2 to infinity like that. Oh, OK, thank you. Yep. And if this was a bracket, if this was like a closed circle, instead of like an open circle, then this would become a bracket. Oh, OK. And that was totally separate from this problem, so that's the answer. Um, division would be the same, so I'm not, I'm not going to go through uh, a division one. The only thing you have to watch out with um, division is even though you can equal zero, you can't equal zero in the denominator. So when you find the value of x that makes the denominator zero here, which would be what, negative 2.5? No matter what the problem says, don't ever put a bracket on negative 2.5 in this one. Because you cannot include negative 2.5. You'd be dividing by zero if you did. Any question on that? Okay. So if you can't factor it, then you're not going to be able to do the sign chart. Okay, the sign chart relies on finding the factors. So instead, we could graph. So here's one that would be a little bit harder to, to factor because it's cubic. So let's see if we can graph it. And there's two ways we can do it. We talked a little bit about both ways yesterday. What's one way that I could graph this on the calculator? Yeah. Would you put 
left side and y1 and the right side and y2? Sure, that, that's one way to do it. We can just put the left side as is in y1. So x cubed minus 2 x squared minus 5x plus 7. And then we've got 2x plus 1. Let's start with zoom 6. And we'll see how that window looks. So the cubic graph is the blue one. It's not a bad window. And the red graph is going to be the linear one. Right. And in terms of like color coding it, they're looking for where the blue one is above the red one. All right, so what do we have to find here? Yep. We would find the intersects. Yeah, we have to find the intersects. Is there any question on how you would find the intersects? If not, I'm just going to label them generically like A, B, and C. Is there any question on how to find them? No? Okay, so let's say that this one is A, comma, again, it doesn't matter, some y value there. The y value is not important. This one would be B, comma, and again, you get some y value. And let's call this one C comma, and again, some y value that we don't need. So can somebody give me an interval where the graph in blue is above the graph in red? Table? Would it be Bracket A, comma, bracket B, or G, Exactly, yep. From, I'll highlight it in green. Well, I want to highlight it in green. That is one section of the graph that is above the red line. And that is from A to B. You'd have to find what A and B are with an intersect. Uh, but there's also another section. You can just barely see it, but there is another section. Yep. C to infinity. C to infinity. This part in blue is just going to keep going up, and it's always going to be above the red line. That part's going to go almost straight up. So the other part is from C to infinity. Now, the reason I use the brackets is because it said equal to. The graphs can be equal or higher. If they wanted to know the opposite of that, where is the blue one underneath? I would say from negative infinity to A, and from B to C. That's where it would be less than 2x plus 1. But that would be your answer. Any questions on that no. one? The longest part of that is probably just finding the intersects and typing it in on the calculator. It's all, it's all it's nothing to really show by hand here. All right, so that's um, 2.5. So 3.1 uh, is also a lot of stuff on the calculator and some stuff I've been kind of telling you as we've gone along. And the first thing they describe in this section is basically what is a polynomial? So polynomials, we've been working with them a lot and I've been using that word. They usually have a term, and we write the highest exponent. And then there's another term, and we write the next exponent down. And then another term, and we write the next exponent. Till finally we get all the way down to a term that doesn't have an exponent, just has an x. And then the last term we usually write is a constant. You don't always have every single term. I don't have the x to the 7th, 6th, 5th, 4th, 3rd, or 2nd. I skip them all. That's still a polynomial. And these numbers in front just represent the coefficients. Like we could call, you know, this is the coefficient a sub m. So 
So maybe if you had, you know, uh, if you had 10 terms, you know, this would be a sub 10, meaning it's the 10th coefficient. It's the one all the way in the front. Then we have the ninth coefficient, the eighth coefficient, the seventh, the sixth, the fifth, the fourth. Right? All these different numbers that are in front. In my case, my coefficients here were just ones. But they can be numbers that are ones. The exponent in a polynomial always has to be a non-negative integer. So no fractions or decimals for exponents. And we also can't have any... Um, so no fractions and decimals and no negatives. Uh, don't worry about that. <laughs> so as long as the highest coefficient isn't a zero, okay, the one I'll usually we put it in decreasing order on the left, then the exponent on that term is what we call the degree. So if you had something like this, 5x to the fourth minus 8x cubed plus 3x minus 7. The degree there is the highest exponent, which in this case is 1. 4. Now, if you did this, this is what I'm saying, that, that's not a degree 4 anymore. It's really degree what? 3. 3. You might say, well, yeah, the highest exponent is a 4, but not really. That term isn't even there because you made you made the coefficient of that a zero, so you might as well just cross that out, erase it, and then, okay, what's the next highest one? All right? That'd be kind of tricky if they did something like that, but just make sure that the highest exponent term doesn't have a zero. If it does, erase it, and then look at the next term. All right? So the highest exponent is the degree of the polynomial. A couple of them have names. Degree one is linear, two is quadratic, three is cubic. Four, they do call quartic. But beyond that, we just say like a polynomial with degree one, or I mean, sorry, like degree five, polynomial of degree seven. They don't really have special names. Now, the nice thing about polynomials is if they ask you to find the domain, it's all real numbers. Because in polynomials, you never have square roots and you never have fractions with variables in the bottom. So with a polynomial, you can always plug in any number you want. The range depends. If it's, we're gonna learn more later on about it, but if it's an even degree polynomial, like a parabola, it ends up going in one direction forever, either up or down. If it's an odd degree polynomial, it looks more like that. One end goes down, the other end goes up, so it ends up going up and down forever. So the range can depend. Is it an even degree where it just goes in one direction, or is it an odd degree where it goes in both? So that we can check out on a calculator if we need to. But the domain, you shouldn't even think about it. All real numbers. So we've talked about cubic functions before. That's generally what cubic functions can look like. We've seen those different kinds of graphs. Fourth degree polynomials look something like that. Okay, a fourth degree polynomial can turn three times, making like a W shape. And if you had an axis in here, we've talked about how the highest exponent tells you how many times the graph could cross the x-axis. A fourth degree polynomial might not cross the x-axis at all if your axis was down here like this. Or it might cross once, or twice, or three times, or four times. So there's lots of possibilities when you have a, a fourth degree polynomial with how many times it crosses the x-axis. You can get zero through four. All right. So let's find the domain and the range of this. What's the domain? Um, All real numbers. There's no square roots. There's no fractions with variables in the bottom. You can plug in any number that you want and raise it to the fourth power. You can 
plug any number you want in in Cuban. There's no restriction. It's a domain. All wheels. Now, this is an even degree polynomial, okay, degree four. So it's going to end up only going in one direction. So we have to figure out, does it have a minimum value and go up, or does it have a maximum value and go down, like an upside down problem? So x to the fourth plus 5x cubed plus 2x squared minus 8x plus 1. So Leanne, does this look like a parabola that goes up forever or down forever? Up forever. Yeah, it's going to go up forever. It's like a W shape. But if it goes up forever, then that means it hits a bottom somewhere. Can I see the bottom that it's hitting? No. no. Let's set our line in a little bit lower. Let's try like negative negative 20. Probably be fine. And how would I find the range here? What do you think I would want to calculate on my calculator? Yeah? Calculate zero? No. Yeah, I don't need to know where it crosses the x axis. Yeah, I meant, yeah, I'm sorry, calculate minimum. Yeah, I want to calculate the minimum. Because we know it'll hit every value from the minimum up. So let's find the minimum. And the minimum is going to be, go to the left, go to the right, do our guess. What's the minimum value that this graph ever hits? Yep. Yes, and that's what I want to know. I don't care where it hits it. I care what, what is it. Negative 11.95. So the range does hit that number is from negative 11.95 and it goes up forever. If you zoom out, these just keep going. So it's a W shape. Any question on that? You no, know, we've done that, finding the minimum before. Um, so this talks a little bit more about what is that thing we just found? It's, it's called a minimum. But when we're talking about mins and maxes, there's something else called a local min or a local max. When I say that this is a local minimum right there, I'm not saying that it is the minimum. I'm not saying that that's as low as the graph ever goes. I'm just saying it's lower than everything else around it. That's a local minimum. And a local maximum is higher than everything else around it. If we look back at this graph, that's a local minimum. It's not the global minimum. Global means the lowest value ever. That's a global minimum. It's also local, but we could even be more specific and say it's not only a local area that's lower than everything around it, it's lower than everything, period. There's not, nothing lower ever. This is called a local maximum. It's not the highest value we ever hit, but it is higher than everything else around it. Okay, so local mins and maxes. Right, so kind of formalizing what I just said, a local maximum is a point on a graph that's higher than all other points around it. It's basically where it, like, like the top of a mountain. That's what, that's what a local uh, maximum looks like. If you want to get really fancy, you can say your graph goes from a positive slope to a negative slope. That's a local maximum. A local minimum is a point on a graph that is lower than everything else around it. That's a local minimum. That's a local minimum. That's a maximum. And together, we call local mins and maxes local uh, extrema. 
So there, if you see a question on the test or in the homework that says find all local extrema, that means I'm looking for you to tell me the local mins and maxes. How do we do it? We use the calculator, second calc, minimum or maximum, whichever one you want to find. Let's type this one in um, just to practice and especially understand what the wording means here. Because there's a difference between if I say what is the minimum versus where is the minimum. Different question. So x cubed minus 4x. Okay, so this one definitely has a local min and a local max. What is the local minimum and where does it occur? So second count minimum. And let's just write down what we've got. Okay. So the minimum is the y value. The minimum is actually how low does the graph go. Where it occurs is the x value. So the min. Occurs when x is 1.15 and the minimum value is negative uh, 3.08. So any question on the difference between what the minimum is and where it occurs? I have a question that's yep. not that, but I have a different question. Mm -hmm. um, is every curve, like is every maximum and minimum a local, local minimum and maximum? Yes, every, every, yeah, but not the other way around, like a global. So this is definitely a local minimum. This is a local minimum, but it's also a global minimum because it looks like it's the lowest that the function ever goes period. There is nothing that ever goes lower than that. So everything can be considered a local minimum. Um, but that's also what we call a global minimum. And this would be a global maximum, which is also local, but it's, it's even more. It's global. Um, find the local maximum. I think it's actually symmetrical. It's just negative 1.15 and positive 3.08. But I think it, it's a reflection of that point. And I think this is the last thing, increasing and decreasing. Okay. So if you look at this function, it basically just has to do with um, slope. Where is this function increasing, or where does it have a positive slope? B to C. B to C. Um, we'll just say from B to C. I won't include the B or the C because right at B or C it's flat. But it's increasing from B to C. Where is it decreasing? A to B. A to B. Yep. And C to D. So what happens, this is going to be, where is it increasing? Uh, I already wrote that. Where is it decreasing? I wrote that up above too. What happens when you go from increasing to decreasing? Something occurs that we just talked about. Every time you go from increasing to decreasing, you, you end up with a, yep. Yeah. Oh, um, I was going to say the graph switches directions, but um, is it the local maximum? Yeah. Every time you go from an increasing to a decreasing, you create a local maximum. Okay, so what happens when a function goes from increasing to decreasing? You get a local max. Could be global. 
local too, like in the case of a parabola. That's local, but it's also global. Well, that's a minimum. Now, what happens as you go from decreasing to increasing? That's like point B. What do you get there, Nick? A uh, local minimum? Yeah, you get a local minimum. So if you have a function that goes from decreasing to increasing, you get a local minimum. All right. So let me put up pretty much that covers everything that we wanted to go over. Let me put up the homework and then in the last couple minutes I'll give you a list of topics that are on the test. First part of the homework that's on the sign pattern, and then the second part of the homework that is on uh, calculating minimums and maximums and that kind of stuff using a graphic calculator. All right, so here's a list of the topics that are on the test, which includes solving quadratic inequalities, finding the domain and range of functions using the graphing calculator to solve inequalities by calculating roots and intersections, solving both absolute value and non-absolute value inequalities, solve equations using the quadratic formula, um, solving basic linear equations and inequalities, using the graphing calculator to find local max and minimums, and an interest, uh, interest rate problem using the formula I equals PRT. Right? So that's everything uh, that is on the test.